Rock musicians in the 1960s popularized Hindu ideas in, in, uh, in the Americas as well. And the New Age movement began to grow in California. Now, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and his transcendental meditation movement began to grow and attract many celebrities, including the magician Doug Henning. Um, one of the most famous breakaways of the TM movement is Deepak Chopra, um, who essentially, and did I miss these personalities somewhere? I don't know, these slides seem mixed up, but anyhow. Um, one of the most famous breakaways of the TM movement is Deepak Chopra, who essentially repackages Hindu and Vedic ideas in a modern American multimedia context. The former counterculture is now more or less central to mainstream U.S. consumer culture. Um, operating out of the U.S., which is the dominant but by no means only center of global popular culture, these proponents of Hinduism and essentially Indic practices have become world famous, albeit in a questionable context that is often very much against the core values of the ancient Saraswati civilization. At the same time, the, Hindu, the growing Hindu population in the US is a very largely self-enclosed immigrant world with very little connection to these currents in mainstream America. Um, the nature of this immigration largely economic and individualistic, shapes its cultural char character. They, they seem to recognize that, although superficially Indic, uh, there are deep contradictions which separate them from these forms. The exceptions probably come with various Indian gurus and swamis, inclusive of Deepak Chopra, but also with teachers like Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev or Sai Baba or the ISKCON movements where some level of integration and coordination are occurring. Um, but you know, at the same time, for instance, there is you know, some controversy about cultural appropriation of yoga and so forth. But while this process in the USA is very important, uh, I do not think that these movements and organizations sufficiently root into culture in the Americas in an organic and sustainable way. There's too much of a fad element uh, where are these guys? Oh. Yeah, this is mixed up. Anyway. Too much of a fad element that threatens to submerge it all when a new trend inevitably comes. In addition, the deep association of Hinduism with the counterculture, even though the counterculture is now mainstream, uh, fundamentally pits it against traditional Americanism, unlike the earlier strand introduced by Emerson. Okay. Even outside of its association with the counterculture, there is an inevitable ceiling to the acceptance and tolerance of Vedic, Indic ideas and culture in historically Christian and now post-Christian America. Indic practices are essentially an alien cultural input, which can be incorporated into the American melting pot, to be sure, but which will not likely ever dominate. This is perhaps true for the Americas as a whole. Now, I'm not saying this to be pessimistic or negatively critical. Much of what is being done in the USA to spread Indic culture is important and absolutely necessary. However, what I am arguing is that in order for this work to be more organically rooted and sustainable in the America, it, needs, it must be more systematically tied to and associated with the Indic cultural complex in the Southern Caribbean. Indeed, this Center for Indic Studies is one such fine example of that. Now, I want to speak about Indic culture in the American Trinidad. Now, a decade after Emerson introduced transcendentalism, and significantly before Swami Vivekananda arrived in the US, the first shipload of Indian indentured laborers arrived in the West Indies. This would continue until 1917. This year marks 100 years since the abolition of indentureship, the end of the indentureship program. And about half a million souls coming to and transforming the Southern Caribbean occurred in the process. This includes my ancestors and ancestors of Acharya Ramsamut. The indentured laborers Re replaced the newly freed slaves on the plantations while slavery was still legal in the United States it had been abolished in the West Indies. They had five-year contracts of 
bonded labor, which were often renewed. The majority of people came from the Hindu heartland, the Gangetic Plains, where Ram, Krishna, Buddha, the Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empires were centered. But by the time the immigration happened in 1845, that historically rich region was devastated, degraded. To this day, it remains a very economically, culturally, socially degraded area of India where, where many people are ashamed to, to say they are from that part. It, 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 the devastation has been um, traumatic. Uh, the region it was devastated by the plundering East India Company and turned into the production center for the British trade in opium, which financed their empire. Uh, many of the indentured laborers, who I guess you could say they were essentially refugees from company rule in Calcutta, stayed in the West Indies and built villages, social orders, and economies based on their inherited and instinctive Indic culture. From medicinal herbs to common and obscure Indic practices, these all exist and flourish in Trinidad and the Southern Caribbean. By no means have they been fully documented, recorded, catalogued, or studied. Many are peculiar to certain villages or certain families, and have been passed on for generations. Some of this has been most famously written about by B.S. Naipaul, the Nobel laureate, and Amitav Ghosh in his brilliant The Sea of Poppies trilogy. Anthropologists from Morton Class in the 1960s to Stephen Bertebeck in the 1990s or Karen Prorock today have written substantial works on Indians in Trinidad in particular. In Trinidad, Indians form the largest single ethnic group, although not a majority. Now, there have been two prime ministers of Indian descent, um, one head of state, uh, both the prime ministers were Hindu, the head of state was Muslim. Uh, Indic music, food, and religious observances are a part of daily life of all Trinidadians, no matter what the ethnic or religious background. Diwali is a national holiday of major significance. The public school system includes hundreds of Hindu and Muslim schools, which are open to all ethnicities since they are publicly funded. Temples abound, some of which are tourist attractions. Uh, religious observances and pilgrimages to beaches and rivers, processions in public streets, and performances in public spaces are observed by hundreds of thousands of people on a, on a monthly basis. The English dialect, which is spoken by all Trinidadians, contains many Hindi origin words and are used and understood by all speakers. I, I believe that for American advocates and practitioners of Indic culture, it's extremely important to witness that culture in, in a living context in Trinidad. I think it will enrich, and deepen, and bring an important perspective to your own activity. You don't necessarily have to go all the way to India to experience an Indian culture. Um, and, and, the context out of which certain philosophical and other practices exist. Indians are part and parcel of Trinidad society and economy, dominant in many professions, such as doctors, lawyers, teachers, politicians, public servants, media workers, business people, tradesmen, trade unionists, etc. They, they all bring some level of Indic sensibility to whatever role and function they perform in society. Hindus and Hinduism form national culture in Trinidad and Tobago. While Indians exist throughout the Caribbean, from Jamaica to the Southern American mainland, it is in the Southern Caribbean, Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname, where they form a majority or the single largest ethnic group in their respective societies. They have been crucial to the very shaping of the society for more than a century before independence in the 1960s. Now, even though there are more Indians in Guyana than in Trinidad, it is Trinidad's Indian culture which is dominant in the region, particularly its popular culture, such as chutney music, but also its religious culture. Indic culture cannot be excised or erased from these societies. It is unavoidable and fundamental. It has produced many great men, from V.S. Naipaul, himself part of the talented and prominent Kapalil clan, to Acharya Ramsa. I want to speak about the importance of, man, of Trinidad in manifesting the ancient Saraswati civilization in the Americas. Now this brings us to the discussion of Acharya Ramsamuj, 
who emerged out of this Trinidadian context. As noted at the beginning of this lecture, Hinduism and the ancient Saraswati civilization are not exactly the same thing. Uh, Hinduism today has lost much, particularly the civilizational context in which the culture of the Saraswati civilization flourished and made sense. In Trinidad, I'm not saying that the ancient Saraswati civilization exists. I'm saying that Hinduism is permanently embedded in the society. It is simply a fact that Hinduism provides the best portal to try and recover the Indic practices of the ancient Saraswati civilization. Acharya Ram Samuj appeared to understand that instinctively in Trinidad. As Hinduism developed and grew in Trinidad, Acharya Ramsamuj was discontent with the direction in which the Trinidadian Brahmin community was leading the ordinary people. The local pundits operated at, at low levels of literacy and were not known for being scholarly. As the local Indian population became more and more educated and accomplished, they became alienated from their relatively uneducated religious leaders. Um, V.S. Naipaul and his father, Sipasad, has written about this famously, especially in the mystic Masur and Guru Deva and other tales. In the 1940s, many discontented, prominent Hindus for, founded a local branch of the reformist Indian Arya Samaj movement in Trinidad. This was significant in that the Arya Samaj movement sought to focus on the ancient Vedas rather than the medieval Ram Charitmanas, which is extremely popular in Trinidad Hinduism. The Arya Samajas wanted to deepen the philosophical discourse and the intellectual content of Hinduism in Trinidad. This would also inevitably, and perhaps unintentionally, lead to the gradual, gradual discovery of the culture of the ancient Saraswati civilization. Acharya Ramsa, which felt that the dominant Hindu organization in the country, which is the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha, was not doing enough, perhaps even purposely, to educate the mass of the ordinary people in Indic culture, perhaps in order to maintain a knowledge monopoly for the Sanat and Dharma's pundits. Acharya Ramsamuj joined the Arya Samaj movement in the 1940s and eventually became its first, and to this date, only Dharmacharya, meaning the highest spiritual leader, something akin to a pope. He began to offer Ved Yaga, Yagyas, which are public Hindu prayer gatherings say, based on the ancient Vedas rather than the usual Ramayana. Yagya. In the 1950s, Acharya Ramsamuj established the first Hindi schools in Trinidad in an effort to spread the knowledge of Indic culture and also to enhance the ability of ordinary people to engage with that culture linguistically. In Trinidad, the language or the Hindi dialect of Bhojpuri was dominant. But by the 1960s, it was dying out um, to the point where it's virtually dead today as a living language, and only English is understood by um, Acharya Ram Samuj also became the first person in the Caribbean to receive advanced level certification in Hindi from the University of London in the early 1970s. The work of Acharya Ram Samuj has borne fruit in Trinidad, but still only at a subcultural level. There is a core person a core of persons in Trinidad who are interested in the ancient Saraswati civilization, in discovering more about it, and in seeking to establish it in some living form in Trinidad. Organizations and activities exist in this vein with regard to religious practices, music, the learning and teaching of Sanskrit, of, of Hindu philosophy, of ancient Indic knowledge and astrology, Ayurveda, and many other areas. However, the challenges are multiple in Trinidad. For one, Hinduism is not the dominant religion on the island, although it is the second largest religion. In addition, most Hindus are woefully uneducated and many uninterested in ancient Vedic culture. Indeed, somewhat ironically, the largest Hindu organization on the island appears to be opposed to the deep delving into and widespread dissemination of Indic culture. Despite this, Aspects of that culture exist all around the island in daily cultural practices and in the built and natural environment, even if unrecognized. This is a struggle that Acharya Ramsamuj had in Trinidad and the one that his son is engaged in, both in the United States and in Trinidad. 
The challenge is to find a way to manifest and root the ancient Saraswati civilization in multi-ethnic and multi-religious Trinidad, and through it, the entire Americas. I believe that it can be done. Not necessarily that Indic culture will be the dominant force, uh, but that it will be a permanently and organically rooted one, um, permanently part of the American cultural landscape, I mean, the Americas as a whole, even if a minority tendency within the American context, where there also exists large European, African, Iberian, and ancient um, Amerindian uh, cultural complexes. The, the work you are doing here in the U.S. is important and crucial. It's like the many branches of a mighty oak tree, um, but it needs to be connected to the right roots and seeds and, and soil. And just as I believe it's important for American practitioners of Indic culture to connect to Trinidad Indian culture, so too is it important for practitioners of Indian Indic culture in Trinidad to connect to the U.S. Uh, in order to learn to communicate with the rest of the world more effectively. Trinidadians generally need more practice and skill in that area, and this connection with, um, with the U.S. culture is very important. But in our efforts to recover and establish the ancient Saraswati civilization here in America, let us assure that our efforts are joined together, as is being done right here today. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, my simple question is that, you know, you said that about 100 years back, uh, they became from India. Uh, is it by choice or by force, number one? Or were they forced to go and then leave the country and then work in the West Indies? You know? That's one thing. And secondly, uh, you said that there is a continuation of uh, the culture there in the uh, Caribbean region. Uh, that being so, said so, uh, are there any temples there? There are temples or anything, uh, those uh, religious, uh, these things are. Uh, what the people trained there locally, or did they, did you have people uh, coming from India, from Vedic schools, you know, when they had the Vedic partners and all, and they learn and then come over and train them? Right. Um, the first question in terms of the native.